Hello everyone, in this tutorial I'm going to show you how to paint a pheasant in acrylics. So this video is really going to focus how to capture the vibrant colours and the iridescent feathers that these birds have. The techniques I'm going to show in this video could be put for a hummingbird, any bird or any animal like that where yet they do have that sheen and that iridescent look. But to start with I did an airbrush background on this Frederick's beveled round canvas. I like to create a really nice soft background here because I wanted the main focus to be the bird itself. So all I'm doing at the moment is starting off with a, a neutral grey. I'm not really worried about the specific colour at this stage. Each additional colour that I add I'm going to be trying to get a little bit more accurate to what I've got in mind. But my first couple of layers I do just want to get rid of the, the white look of the canvas. Now these Frederick's canvases, the round ones, are a little bit more toothier than their blue label. So what I like to do is apply a layer of the gesso. I like using the Liquitex gesso and what I then do is just wait for that to dry and then lightly sand it before I start doing any kind of painting on it so that then it's got a bit more of a smoother surface. Now the surface that you like to paint on is going to come down to personal preference but I do find that the smoother the surface the nicer details, you're, you're the smoother the details you're going to be able to get. Now that being said, I have used an ultra smooth surface like the Ampersand smooth panel boards and they for me are far too smooth. There's no texture at all to that surface. So there is a bit of a fine line between it but certainly for these canvases and other canvases, apart from the blue label by Fredericks, I do like to put a layer of gesso down first just to get that smoother surface. And what I'm doing here is just starting to add the shadows from the, the grass and I'm going to just keep these nice and out of focus. When you're working with an airbrush, in order to create this look, you want to keep that airbrush fairly held a, a good distance away from your, your, your canvas. The closer you get to your canvas with that airbrush, you'll just start to create those sharper looking lines. So anything blurry, hold that, you know, a good foot away from that canvas in some instances to help to create this really nice out of focus effect. You can see here though that for the most of it I'm holding my hand just you know about four or five inches away from that canvas. Now you wouldn't necessarily have had to have done this with an airbrush but it does give you a very soft out of focus look. If you were to do this just with traditional paintwork and brushwork sorry what I would be doing is applying that layer and keeping it wet with a fine mist sprayer bottle applying another layer on top and then using a large soft blending brush like a, a makeup brush to to completely blend and get that soft out of focus that way but as I say the airbrush does give you a very unique look so to start with the bird itself like with any animal that I paint or draw I always start off with the eye even on something like this where it is very small and not the main focus of this painting, I still want to make sure that I've got it accurate. So there I was using a white charcoal pencil and I was just starting to freehand some of the beak area that I'd missed in on my initial sketch. The white charcoal pencil will be able to completely be erased when you come and put your paint layers on top, whereas a standard graphite pencil will still show through. So if you are going to be doing any kind of freehanding on your canvas or any of your panels, your, your boards maybe, make sure to use a white charcoal pencil or a water soluble graphite if you need a darker lead. So the beak here, I'm really focusing on the lighting. I want my shadows and my highlights to be as dark and as bright as they need to be in order to capture the texture within this beak. Now this is a very small surface area for the beak that I'm working on because most of this bird, as you can see from the finished painting in the corner, is going to be taken up with those chest feathers, those really nice beautiful colours. But even though this is a small area, I still want to make sure I've given it the time and attention that it needs, just like with that eye. That eye is tiny, but I still want to make sure I've got that highlight in the right place and that I've got the shape of the black pupil and the yellow coloured iris around it accurate. And when I'm working with acrylics, while I'm waiting for one area to dry, I will then work on the area next to it and then I'll work sort of back and forth between those two or three areas while those layers are drying so that I can get the painting done a bit quicker. Now, if you would like to see the, the tips, the techniques, this whole process in much slower footage, I've got the nearly five hour video available on my Patreon channel. It's split up into two parts. The first part, I focus on the face and the neck. And then the second part, which is the longer part of the two, focuses on how to get these iridescent feathers on the body. So if these slower tutorials are of interest, I'll link my Patreon in the description below. 
I've also got a Patreon library on my website where it lists all of the tutorials on my pastel tier and my acrylic tier so that you can see the kind of content that I've got available over there before you sign up. And the good thing with Patreon is you can cancel at any time and the, the tutorials that I've got there are very in-depth. They're step by step and if you've got any questions about anything then feel free to message me at any time. So I'm going to start working now on the red area around the face. Now my main aim here was to get this colour really, really vibrant, nice and punchy. So I want to make sure that I've got this really nice saturation in place. I want to get the contrast where it needs to be as well with those black feathers towards the, the left of it and get that contrast as sharp as it needs to be. And the contrast in the lighting is something that I talk about in every single tutorial more so than the exact colour. I want to make sure that I've got this red but I don't necessarily have to be fixating that I'm getting it completely accurate to that photo. This bird, the photo could be taken at a slightly different time of day and this red might be more of a magenta red. I just want to make sure that I've got that sharp contrast in place first. The main thing about this area here of these nice the dark areas with the little bit of turquoise you can see showing through is I want to make sure that I'm indicating that the feathers here do start to change colour. All of these little variations from the turquoise, the teal, into the red, some of the bluer feathers, are all going to help to create this iridescent sheen. Now the feathers on the neck here don't necessarily have that same iridescent look like what they do on the body, but they do certainly shimmer, so I want to make sure that I've got that in my painting. The one way that we're going to be able to do that is all through the lighting. We need to make sure that the base layer is as dark as it needs to be, and then the lighter feathers on top are getting gradually lighter. You'll see that when I get to the neck portion of this tutorial that I don't skip up to my brightest highlights first. Just like when I'm painting fur, I always start with my subtle layers and I build up my bright layers gradually. I find that this is the best way of building as much realism and detail within that fur, or in this case the feathers. And really with feathers as well we are focusing on the texture just like with fur. Maybe if you've got a wiry type of dog like a border terrier or a labrador where you've got such much smoother and softer fur, the feathers are exactly the same. The feathers on the red part of the, the marking on the face here are very different to the ones on the lower part of the neck. They're a completely different shape, they travel in a completely different direction. So I want to make sure, like when we are painting fur, that we are studying that reference photo really closely. Now for this I'm using a mixture as you can see of very small brushes. This is because I want to make sure that I've got these details as controlled and as intricate as I can possibly get. Because the feathers here are tiny, in relation to the body feathers or even the lower neck feathers, these ones here are very very subtle. They're only two or three millimetres long at the most, so I want to make sure that I'm working with those smaller finer brushes that can get those details. And if you've seen other of my acrylic tutorials here on YouTube, you'll know that I don't like really working with larger brushes. Now the reason for that is, is I find that it's a lot more tempting to block in more of that colour everywhere in a larger space than you would technically need. So I find by working with slightly smaller brushes, I'm able to actually pay attention to my reference photo that much clearly. I think working with the smaller brushes enables me to be a lot more precise to my reference photo. As I said, I don't have a tendency to just put colour everywhere, which I do find, for me anyway, is something that can happen when I'm working with my larger brushes. If I'm doing a background, for instance, that would be different, and I was using the Fine Mist sprayer bottle, I would be therefore using a larger brush. The smaller brushes you're using in that case would mean that the paint would dry much quicker than you need it to be. So for a background, I would be considerably using larger brushes, to make sure that that paint is applied to that layer or that surface as quickly as I can so that it can stay wetter for longer. But for the actual subject itself like this, I, I will very rarely go bigger than a size 6 round or the size 4 filbert. They're two of my preferences for the blocking in stages. Obviously how I'm moving the brush here is a lot it's harder to see because the videos here on YouTube are sped up. That's something that I go in depth in my Patreon tutorials. You can really see how I'm positioning my hand, how I'm moving that brush, and also how much pressure I'm putting on that brush. You'll be able to see from how much the bristles bend as to how much pressure I'm applying to that brush at that time. When you're working with brushes, specifically liner brushes and, and rigger brushes, the more pressure that you put on that brush, the thicker that your line will be. And that is usually the case with any of the brushes that you've got, regardless of the shape. But certainly in some instances, you need to be applying light pressure to that brush in order to get those finer details. 
you wouldn't want to be too heavy handed because you wouldn't get the desired look with that brush that you're going for. Now what I also tended to do is, I, in my tutorials I speak about getting an area or that part of the painting to about 80% complete before I move on to the next. What I did with this is slightly differently. I approached this where I actually got the area finished first and then moved on to the area below it. So at the moment here I didn't actually go back and add any real details to the face at all. Now the reason for that is this is the one painting that challenged me the most and still today is the one that I will remember for being the most complex. It was only the second bird that I had painting in acrylics and it is a challenge. All these tiny little feathers and also creating this iridescent look really did push the, my skills but it, it was worth it. I was very tempted midway through this to put it away and, and just not finish it. One of the reasons why I didn't do that is because these canvases are not cheap so I didn't want to waste it. And also I think it's important when we do have a piece where we are struggling with it, we find it quite challenging, it's really good to finish that piece because we learn so much. And that's another thing that I talk about in the Patreon version where for this I've learned so many new techniques and, and the way that I would approach feathers like this in the future. And what I'm going to do for Patreon is actually paint a hummingbird and I'm going to apply the techniques that I learned and I spoke about in the slower video and I'm going to apply those to a different painting where I need to create that iridescent feather look again. Because I certainly found that when working with uh, you know the, the look like this, those bright colours, that iridescent look, the glazes was so important and I think I could have used them more for this piece. So that's something that I really want to try in a future painting. And this is also another reason why I like doing the Patreon videos because it means that all of that information where I've maybe learnt to do something in a slightly different way, I can tell my Patreon members that so that they don't have to make that same it's not really a mistake but that process that can slow it down. I certainly did spend more time on this painting than I would normally do for something this size and that was because I was still having a bit of experimenting and trial and error trying to get the feathers and the colour, the iridescent look, how I wanted it. But by the time I'd got three quarters of the way through this painting I knew exactly what I had to do to create the look that I wanted. And as I say that's what I like so I can then let my members on Patreon know of that so they can skip out those steps that I've learnt from. But as I say, that being said, that doesn't mean that it's a bad thing. That extra knowledge that we gain from the paintings where we do find them challenging but we've still finished them and we're happy with the look that we get at the end means that we've got all of that additional knowledge and information to put towards the next painting. It can only help but grow us as artists. Throughout this video as well, you'll be able to see that I use the technique of working from dark to light for majority of this painting. And because we do have the ability of layering endlessly with acrylics, as long as that layer underneath is dry, we do have that option of not worrying that we're not going to be able to go bright enough. When I work with the, the pastels, even though it's on the pastel matte paper, we do still have to take into consideration at times whether or not we're going to put a lighter colour, for instance on the reflection of the eye. If I want that white to be super bright, I will use my white pastel pencil first for that highlight to make sure that I've got that one area as bright as it needs to. Whereas with something like this, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have to worry about that. We know that we can apply that bright white as as at any stage really and it still look as bright as we need it to be even with a dark base layer. Now when I got to this part on the Patreon version I really did sort of explain and go in depth how crucial it is to get these feathers travelling in the right direction. It is really important. Just like when I explain and mention about the way that fur travels and the direction that the fur sometimes changes quickly or whether or not it slopes away gradually all of these things indicate at the muscle and skeletal structure underneath the skin. That's exactly the same with the feathers. They are really sort of cushioning all of those structures underneath the skin so they do not sit in a random position. They do travel and curve in a specific way for a reason. Now the feather direction for this in particular is going to be even more vital to get accurate because the bird is walking towards the camera. We want to give the illusion that we are really hinting at that movement. We don't want it to look like the body is two-dimensional. 
So what we want to do is make sure that we've got that lighting in the right place. We've got any reflective light on the left hand side accurate. And we want to make sure that we've got the th feathers curving in the right direction and that they're catching the light in the right way as well. All of these different things are going to help to reinforce that the bird is walking towards the camera. For instance, if you look at the painting in the corner, the left leg is in front where he's about to take that step forward. So therefore the shimmer on the chest is going to be in the position and in, in that place on the body to show that that is how that bird is moving. The lighting therefore is not random, it's really important. The light source is vital to capture with any subject that we're painting on, not just any kind of movement. But really, the way that we are going to be able to replicate the movement in the reference photo isn't just by getting the stance accurate, it is the lighting. With one leg forward, it's going to catch more of the light down the leg, and you'll see that as we get towards the end of this video. All of these highlights and the shadows are really important to make sure that we capture this movement. It's also going to help with the iridescent look with the feathers. Now something I learnt from this painting is that every bird tends to have different shaped feathers. So the only other bird painting that I'd done before this pheasant was an eagle. Their feathers are much larger and I find that they were a lot more uniformed in their shape. Whereas with this bird, the feathers on the top of the wing along the back were very different compared to the ones on the chest. And as the wing starts getting lower to the ground, the feathers again change shape. And this is unique to this bird, so it's something again that I wanted to make sure that I got as accurate as I could. Now when I'm painting feathers like this, the same with fur really, I'm not focusing on getting every single individual feather in place. Uh, that's not important to me. I want to make sure that I've got the look of that bird, I've got the texture of the feathers and as I say the lighting. But I'm not focusing and I'm certainly not counting on the reference photo how many feathers in each row there are. I don't think that that's important. What I want to make sure is I've got the general shape of the feathers, but all, more importantly, and I've said it so many times, is that they curve over in the right direction. They're following that curvature of the bird's chest. And that's something that I have learned very much the more that I've painted and the more portraits that I've drawn. When I first started doing any kind of artwork, I used to really, well I did, I used to count all of the feathers or whatever it is that I was painting. I used to count them all in my reference photo and in some instances I'd start that artwork again because I'd feel like I was not getting enough realism. But what I was actually doing is making the painting look a bit fake and that's because I was just trying too hard. I've now learned that as long as I've got that general feel of whatever it is that I'm painting, I've got these feathers in the right direction, the right shape, but generally that, you know, it looks like those feathers in that reference photo. That is good enough. Now I'm going to be adjusting the colour of these feathers a lot with individual glazes. I'm not going to be putting those glazes everywhere either. That's something that I really do show in depth in the Patreon version because the way to create this iridescent look is some of these feathers are more of the magentas and the purples while some directly next to it I've got more of that orange and the yellow colour. So you really want to make sure that you study that photo to see where these feathers are in terms of the colour because they do seem to be grouped together more. That's going to help when you've got the painting finished, it's going to really help with that iridescent sheen look that we're trying to capture. And although I say that I'm not trying to paint every feather, that is absolutely true. But what I do like to do is map in some of my reference points. Now this again is something that I speak a lot about because it can help to break down that area. I like to work in smaller areas, just like what I'm working on here, the top portion of the wing, I then did the chest, and now I'm going to work on the lower portion, just like what I did with the face, I tackled the red part first, and then the dark area, and then the teal on the bottom of the neck. I find by breaking it down in this way, it becomes far less daunting, especially with a complex subject like this. This is very difficult, as I say, one of the most challenging animals that I've painted so far. But when I broke it down like this, and by this point in the tutorial on Patreon, you could see that I was a lot more sort of confident with what I was doing. I knew the process, I knew the layering that I had to achieve from the knowledge and the information that I'd learnt from the previous part of the painting already. And that's why I'm now approaching this part of the bird slightly differently, but it certainly did work. And it's this difference that I'm going to be putting towards my next iridescent bird painting. 
But going back to reference points, I like to break down individual areas with key elements. If there's one specific feather that I notice more than others, I will paint that in first. That gives me a reference point so that when I look back at that photo and back at my artwork, I can quickly see where I am. It also means that I can fill in the area around it gradually and I can start to make that area that I'm working on even smaller. This does certainly mean that the area that I'm working on, the subject, becomes far less challenging. And once I finished this painting, I was really pleased with what I'd achieved. It also gave me that boost that I thought to myself that if I can paint this accurately, I was pretty confident that I could then paint pretty much anything because, as I said, this was one of the most challenging things that I'd done to date. And if this is something that you think you'd like to paint yourself, I do have the reference photo and the line art provided over on Patreon. So, as I say, I will link my Patreon in the description below. So for this bird, going back to the shape of the feathers and the texture with, you know, it's very different to some other garden birds, for instance. So if you had a little robin, they've got much more of the individual feather texture that you can see. Now, if this was a close up of a pheasant, you would see some of those details. So I don't want to be forcing feather detail where it didn't need to be. And I certainly did learn that on the chest portion. And again, you'll see how I correct that later on in this video. But here, this is very much about following the lighting and the colour to help to create that sheen. Now, magpies also have this teal, aqua, turquoise colour iridescent look to the feathers. So that would be another one where we would apply these techniques um, to that bird as well. But their feathers are completely different. The feathers there are much longer. They're a completely different shape of bird. So we really want to make sure that we are studying any photograph that we're working really closely to make sure that we're getting this as close to that reference photo as we possibly can. Now on the left hand side here you can really see that I'm focusing on that reflective lighting, that glow on the left hand side. It's quite, um, it, it seems like one of the parts where it'd be quite challenging to create this type of glow. But if you work in glazes, it can come together and as you can see here, create that really nice effect. I don't want the lighting on the feathers on the left hand side to be as bright as the right hand side because obviously that will then completely adjust the light source. But there is that glow showing that the iridescent feathers continue on the opposite side of the bird that we cannot see. And this lighting on the left hand side is something that could potentially be missed. So really do zoom in into that photo to make sure that we're capturing any kind of subtle light changes like that. Because what this glow on the left side has done is help to show that this bird sort of curves over towards the left hand side to the other side of the body that we can't see. If I was to have painted this completely dark there, at this section of the bird on the front, it would have looked a little bit more flatter, more two dimensional. So just because I've added some of those highlighted feathers on the left hand side there, it's really helped to create that illusion of the chest and that it's come in further closer towards the viewer. And this isn't just because it's iridescent, the reflective or bounced light would be in some cases on any kind of reference photo depending on that light source. So if you do have that strong light source from one side, quite like what we've got here, you would in some cases have that bounced light. Quite often on dog noses, um, on the wetter parts of the nose, the, the eyes, you are going to have some of this reflective bounce light. And in some instances, it does also reflect some of the colours in the environment as well. So it, if this didn't have this iridescent sheen to it anyway, where with these magentas, these purples and these oranges really coming through and being the predominant colour... If this was something more muted, I have no doubt that there would be some green reflections of the grass in place. And because I have incorporated the grass in this painting, I would therefore be painting the green within this bounce light area. If I'm doing a pet portrait where it's just a head and shoulders painting and I'm not drawing, uh, sorry, I'm not painting any of the grass at all, I would leave out those green reflections. So if the nose had a really strong green reflection, because it is wet, you are going to see those reflections even more. If it did have that strong green tint, but I was not painting or drawing the grass, I would completely leave that out. The reason being that if you don't have that paint, that sorry, the grass in that painting, it's the, the green in the nose or the fur, whatever it might be, it's not going to look 
right it just won't look like it should be there people will then think that you've painted it wrong whereas if they know that they're looking at a reference photo it's the photo they know it's right they they believe that that is how it should be whereas if they see that in a painting but they don't have that grass to relate that green color to they'll assume that we have painted it wrong so in those cases when it is head and shoulder paintings or portraits i like to leave those strong reflections out but for this, because I do have the grass, as I say, if it did have those green reflections in the body or on the legs, I would certainly be painting those in and including them wherever I needed to. And again, the tail area here is an area where I went in depth on my Patreon video because it is out of focus. It's the one part of the bird that's furthest away from the viewer. So I wanted to make sure that I kept my brush strokes soft, that they were blended, they were nice and smooth to help to show and create that look that the tail is a little bit out of focus compared to the body. I did a lot of wet on wet blending techniques for that. I also wanted to keep that paint wetter for longer. And I did also use two brushes, one with paint, one without, and I used the two, switched between the two brushes to help to create that blurred out of focus effect. So the legs and the grass were really the last parts of this painting, but this is gonna really show you that strong light source. The highlights are not going to be random and it's really something that I stress quite a lot about because I want to make sure that I'm really following that as close as I can to the photo. As well these feathers that overlap the background here make it that much more realistic. When you've got a bird like this where you take the left edge of the body for instance that is a solid line. Very rarely do you have instances like that. Most of the time you will have some of the feathers that do overlap that background and some of the fur on a, on a dog for instance would overlap that background. You want to make sure that any time that you do have that, that you include that in your painting. The reason being is otherwise your subject will just look like a sticker that's been stuck onto that canvas. By overlapping some of the feathers or the fur, you are going to make it look like that bird is in front of the background, but part of it, which is obviously what we want. Now I do have a tutorial on Patreon showing you how to paint grass, not this one, although I do go into in depth here with how I painted this as well, but I do have a specific tutorial showing you how to do that. But you can see that I'm keeping the, the brush strokes random for that and that is the biggest thing when we are painting grass. And here is a photo of the finished painting. So this is one that I intended on, on hanging on my own wall. It was for my, for my husband, he asked me to paint this. And as I say, I was really glad when I got it finished. It was very challenging. I nearly gave up on it many times, but I'm really glad that I stuck with it. I learned a lot, which is one of the most important things. So I really hope this tutorial was of use. If it was, I'd really appreciate it if you could give it a thumbs up because it really does help. And if you'd like to get notified of future content, hit the subscribe and the bell button and I'll be uploading another video here to YouTube next week. If the Patreon vid versions, as I've said, are of interest, the link is in the description below. If you've got any questions about anything, pop them below and I'm more than happy to answer them.